Good evening. My name is Ben Wayman. I'm the Andrews Chair for Christian Unity here at Greenville University. Yes. Thank you, Tawan. I see that. Appreciate that. I'd like to welcome you all to our fourth annual Andrews Lecture in Christian Unity. Welcome students and staff and faculty and administration and guests of Greenville University. Tonight is all about the unity that Christ makes possible. As Christians, we celebrate variety and difference. And we believe that our unity in our diversity displays who God is and what God makes possible. I'd like to thank Dr. David Andrews and the members of the Full Salvation Union for endowing a chair in Christian unity here at Greenville. Their gift has shaped our campus life for the better. And tonight's lecture is the most prominent piece of the Andrews Chair programming. And I am elated about our speaker tonight. So it's my privilege to introduce you all to the Reverend Dr. Willie Jennings. Dr. Jennings is Associate Professor of Systematic Theology at Yale University Divinity School. And he also teaches Africana Studies there. He has written a book called The Christian Imagination, The, the Theology and Origins of Race, which won the 2015 Grawmeyer Award in Religion. And Dr. Jennings was a professor at Duke Divinity School when I was a student there. And he was widely respected across campus. And I, I mentioned this this morning, but it needs, it bears repeating. He was widely respected across campus as being a theologian with a rigorous mind, but a full heart for Jesus. I shared also this morning that Dr. Jennings believes that discipleship requires community. We need one another to follow Jesus. Dr. Jennings' chapel talk this morning was on Mark chapter 8, and it modeled beautifully exactly what he was talking about, about the gift of friendship and what Christ makes possible. He showed us that we worship a God of abundance who is set on destroying the lie of scarcity. And so as Christians, we follow Jesus' need. When we see need, or we, saw, we follow Jesus' lead as we see need, and then we respond to it. Over an extended lunch today with students, Dr. Jennings shared that when we isolate ourselves or have superficial relationships, we have a diminished life. It's smaller, it's impoverished. But friends help us flourish because after all, we need friends to follow Jesus. So tonight's format is really just in two pieces. It's really simple. We're gonna hear from Dr. Jennings for about 45 minutes or so. And then we get 30 minutes of conversation with him. So you'll just come down the center aisle, you can line up, and then we'll all be a part of an ongoing conversation about what Dr. Jennings has shared with us. One last thing, what you all need to know is that Dr. Jennings is not only a disciple, but he's a minister. While in Durham, he served along with his wife, the Reverend Joanne Brown Jennings, as associate ministers at Mount Level Baptist Church. And so you should not be surprised tonight if the Reverend Jennings draws you closer to Jesus and to one another. The title for his talk tonight is Being Christian in a World of Possessions. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Willie Jennings. Good evening, everyone. It is a joy and a high honor for me to be here with you uh, this evening. I want to thank Ben for that wonderful introduction and for hosting me so beautifully in my time here. It, is, it has been such a joy to be with him and to be with this wonderful faculty here. You are a a wonderful group of faculty, and I, I pray God's continued blessing upon you. I, I had a great time um, being with the students today. You folks are smart. It's great to be with the students who ask good questions and who um, are inquisitive. So thank you for taking time to spend uh, the day with me. 
I got here yesterday, and uh, I was a little jet lagged. I, I just came from Ghana, and uh, um, so I wasn't sure whether it was morning or night, but um, been put up with me, so I appreciate that. And uh, I certainly enjoyed uh, chapel this morning. I, as a professor, I don't get an opportunity to preach that often, so it, it felt good to do a little preaching this morning. And as I said to the students this morning, I want to also say to you, it's on a Monday, thank you so much, and a rainy Monday, thank you so much for, for coming out to this lecture. I want to also thank those who made this possible. When people offer of their treasure to establish something like this, we, we must always pause to be thankful for that kind of foresight and looking into the future. So it is a great honor for me to be this year's lecturer. I want to bring you warmest greetings from Dean Gregory Sterling, the faculty and staff and students of Yale Divinity School where we endeavor every day to do God's work by convincing men and women that their words matter and that this world is waiting for them to speak the truth. So they would want me to extend Warmer's greetings to you all. As been said, the, the title of my lecture is Being Christian, Being Christian, in a world of possessions. We are not sure of the day or the time, but we do know that this was the most important moment in his life. This was the day that Olauda Aquiano would purchase himself. Aulauda Aquiano, who was born in 1745 in an area of the African continent we would now call Nigeria, was stolen by traders as a very young boy. Now in his 20s, he had worked tirelessly for this day. This was something extraordinary even though it was woven into an absurdity. This African slave would come into possession of himself. This, this extraordinary absurdity was made possible by the kindness of Aquiano's then current master, Robert King considered by Aquiano his most compassionate owner. King agreed in earnest negotiation, that's the way we should put it, in earnest negotiation with Aquiano that he would allow him to buy himself for the exact sum that King paid for Gustavus Vassa as he was then known. 40 pounds, 40 pounds sterling was the amount and the goal to be reached for Gustavus if he would ever be able to lose his slave name and take on his real name. There was inside this kindness of the master a double bind, a double bind. Gustavus would have to make money for his master and also with the time and energy left, which was little, make money literally for himself. The fact that he accomplished this goal was to become a growing testimony to the abilities of Africans in chains to work inside the absurdities and horrors of the white world. Aquiano records this event in his famous narrative, which I recommend to you all. He states in the narrative the following. 
when we had unladen the vessel and I had sold my venture, finding myself master of about 47 pounds, I consulted my true friend, the captain, that is a guy named Captain Farmer, how I should proceed in offering my master the money for my freedom. He told me to come on a certain morning when he and my master would be at breakfast together. Accordingly, on that morning, I went and met the captain there as he had appointed. When I went in, I made my obeisance to my master and with my money in my hand and many fears in my heart, I prayed him to be as good as his offer to me. When he when it was pleased to, to promise me my freedom as soon as I could purchase it. This speech seemed to confound my master. He began to recoil, and my heart, that instant, sank within me. What, he said? Give you your freedom? Why? Where did you get the money? Have you got 40 pounds sterling? Yes, sir, I answered. How did you get it? He replied. I told him very honestly. The captain then said he knew that I got the money very honestly and with much industry and that I was particularly careful. Come, come, said my worthy captain, clapping my master on the back. Come, Robert, come. I think you must let him have his freedom. You have laid your money out very well. You have received good interest for it all this time. And here is now the principle at last. I know Gustavus has earned you more than a hundred pounds a year, and he will still save you money. My master then said he would not be worse than his promise. And taking the money, told me to go to the secretary at the registry office and get my manumission drawn up. End of quote. The first time I read these words of Olauda Aquiano, I was surprised by my response, my friends. I cried. Although separated by centuries and worlds, inexplicably, I felt this moment with him. But what in fact, was this moment of self-purchase. Aquiano, in his narrative, includes his manumission form, that is, the form that allowed him to show that he was now freed. His manumission form, which according to him, illustrates the grotesquerie of this whole thing. One line of that manumission form reads as follows. And again, I quote, I, Robert King, set free a Negro man slave named Gustavus Vassa, hereby giving, granting, releasing unto him all right, title, dominion, sovereignty, and property which as Lord and master over the aforesaid Gustavus, I have had, end of quote. Now, this legal document transfers ownership from one party to another. But at no point in time does it dissolve the idea of ownership. The language used in this document would be the same 
if the purchase and transfer had been for a cow, a horse, or land. A lauda aquiana, in his moment of self-purchase, moved from, pos from possession by another to his own self-possession. And he bathed, he bathed this moment in Christian joy. He gave God praise for his freedom that he had now acquired. This was the world of Alaudo Aquiano. But it is also the world we have inherited, a world not of our own choosing or making. It is a racial world that is also a Christian world. It is a world formed between praise and possession. I want you to hold that together. A world formed between praise and possession, both deeply distorted. It is this deep distortion and its implications for the Christian life that I want us to consider this evening. You see, my friends, the Christianity we have inherited has been shaped in a sick vision of possession. A sick vision of possession and diseased by whiteness. It is this distortion that drives our current dilemmas with race, racism, and white supremacy. Many people today are sensing and seeing this deep distortion without knowing what they are sensing or what they are seeing. We Christians gave to the world a way of understanding the world flawed from its beginning. And it all began, it all began with possession. The world became possession. The world became possession. It began the moment those first Christian colonial settlers stepped onto soil that was new for them and heard sounds that were strange to them and saw people and animals that confused and frightened them. Animals and peoples they had not imagined could exist. These early, let's call them proto-European Christians from the 16th century forward, standing in the new worlds of the Americas, sub-Saharan Africa, the Pacific Islands, and so many other places that were to become colonial holdings, asked themselves an important question, sisters and brothers. Who am I? Who am I in this new place? This was the right, this was the right question, the holy and good question. You see, the newness of a place should always provoke, always provoke in us, provoke from us such questions. The problem came with the answer they gave to that question. These early Europeans answered the question without the voice or the vision of the peoples of the new worlds. And in so doing, they self-designated. That was bad enough. We could stop there, that was bad enough. But the horror continued as they designated vast numbers of remarkably different peoples. As they did this, they quickly began to suture different peoples, clans, and tribes into racial categories. They, the Europeans, were white. And the others, mm, almost white, not quite white, or non-white, or almost black, not quite black, or black. They also created a diseased 
world of designation between white and black, capable of capturing all people, all people in racial identity on a spectrum from black to white. These early European Christians also designated themselves owners. They believed that God had given them the new worlds for one central purpose, to bring the new worlds, the peoples, their ways of life, and the land, and the land into maturity, mature use and mature life, to cultivate it, to make it productive. These Christian settlers believed that the indigenous peoples did not know what they had or what to do with what they had. So it was their God-ordained task to teach them how to make proper use of the land and the animals. Indigenous peoples found themselves surrounded by invaders, that's the word we should use, surrounded by invaders who had a strange new way of thinking possession. These invading European Christian settlers saw possession through break, separation, and enclosure. Break, separation, and enclosure. Where native groups saw possession through continuum connection, and overlap. The former, a possession of. The latter, a possession by. The former made a claim on something. The latter was claimed by something. Now this is no small difference because between these two ways of imagining possession, one world is being destroyed and another world is being created. The indigenous world being destroyed articulated claims to things, claims to things inside the logic of a commons. A commons was a shared place, a shared reality. Now, the Europeans had an idea of a commons too, but their idea of a commons was small spaces of shared land, small islands, if you will, surrounded by a sea of feudal holdings, that is, surrounded by lands owned by kings and lords and their most important servants. This indigenous commons, on the other hand, is everywhere, and each people may have claim to this or that place to hunt or gather foods or celebrate or deliberate or listen to the ancestors and or the animal kin. I did say animal kin. This commons touches tools for use in a logic of sharing, and it touches bodies in shared concern. It also involved a kind of reciprocity with animals and plants and seasons, each requiring attentiveness and respect. Now, it does not preclude, it does not preclude violence or theft or dispute over lands or, or even oppression, but it narrates such horrors when narrations are given through violations of the commons and attacks on communal or even covenantal bonds the world being created by the Christian settlers, in contrast, articulated claims to things inside the logic of control. 
And control has to do with making my world manageable, understandable, containable. Native peoples, as far as the Christian settlers were concerned, had no claim on lands that they did not control in terms of cultivation or productivity. Yet in order to have control, you must have clear demarcation of spaces. And this was, according to the colonialists, another weakness of indigenous peoples. They had no clear boundaries between what was theirs and another tribe, between the permanent lands of one people and the lands of another. That is, they lacked a clear sense of territoriality, a clear sense of enclosure, and a clear sense of boundary. Territoriality, enclosure, boundary. Another way to say this, another way to say this is that the native peoples did not know how to draw lines or think the line or live by the line, live by the line. As Reviel Nez, N-E-T-Z, notes in his marvelous book <clears throat> on the history of Bob Wire, which I recommend to you all, he says, our world, our world, is formed by means of the line. As he says, and I quote, a closed line, a closed line was made in order to prevent motion from outside the line to its inside. And from that closed line, we derive the idea of property. With the same line, we prevented motion from inside the line to the outside, and we derived the idea of the prison. And then with an open line, we prevented the motion in either direction, and from it we derived the idea of border. Property, prison, border. Property, prison, border. It is through the prevention of motion that space enters history. End of quote. So these Christian settlers forced, and I do say forced, all native peoples to learn to live by the line. In so doing, these Christian settlers separated people from the land, believing that the land was not what so many indigenous peoples said it was. It was not alive and speaking to them in, the co in chorus with the voices of their ancestors. The animals were not their kin, not their family. That way of thinking was naive, primitive, <clears throat> and for some Christian settlers, even demonic. The settlers told the natives that one piece of land is like another piece of land. And that is the key word here, sisters and brothers, pieces. Their lands should be understood in pieces. It should be seen in fragmentable, sellable plots. The land should be seen as property on its way to becoming private. We made the world private. Trees and birds, dirt and water, deer and squirrel and beaver, landscapes, rivers, beaches, valleys, we have made the world private and a possession. That which the Christian settlers knew only belonged to God, only belonged to God, they made their possession. And then we followed them 
through the century, making it our own possession. We have learned to think the land through possession. But not just the land, not just the land, but also our bodies. We made possession. Which, we, which brings me back to Aquiano and his moment of self-possession. You see, his moment of self-possession had of necessity, of necessity to operate in the same logic of demarcation, which meant that he had to draw a line around himself. He had to draw a line around himself. Both slaves and indigenous peoples came to understand under this Christian colonialist way of looking at the world that possession connected body and land. Possession connected body and land, bringing to life one's right to exist and one's freedom. To claim oneself, to claim oneself was to possess oneself. And to claim your existence as a people required you lay claim to some piece of land as the space of your cultivation and productivity. Through this vision of possession, ownership and existence, ownership and existence were coupled together and made a crucial aspect of self-determination and self-expression. Yet this is an inverted, distorted idea of possession configured inside laws. What do we lose? We lost the sinews of connectivity, sisters and brothers. The sinews of connectivity that join bodies and join bodies to land. And we lost the ability to see those sinews especially as Christians. We lost the ability to see possession through connection and not connection through possession. That's a simple statement, but incredibly important. We lost the ability to see possession through connection and not connection through possession because we reformatted landscapes and bodies through their demarcation and segregation. We then turned that loss into a lens through which to read the world. What if I told you this evening that Christians, since the emergence of colonialism, have been caught in this loss and trapped in this way of reading. It has affected terribly the way we read scripture and form community. Like many of you, probably most of you, <clears throat> I was raised in the church. And over the, and over the many years of being raised in the church and being in the church, I have heard hundreds of sermons, no, probably thousands of sermons now, Anybody else like that? I've just, I've just heard, yeah, I would say thousands of sermons by now from both testaments, passage after passage. <clears throat> but there is one type of passage I have very rarely, if ever, heard preached, found throughout the Hebrew Bible, and I doubt that you have ever heard it preached too. One type of passage that I have very rarely ever heard preached, and it's throughout the Hebrew Bible. And it is the one that goes something like this. And that is why this place is called, fill in the blank, to this day. And that is why this place is called to this day. The place name is almost always the punchline in the stories in the Hebrew Bible. The hearer or the reader is taught by the story 
to know the place. You cannot read about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob without constantly coming to this point with almost every story about them and their spouses and their children, there will be that punchline. And that is why this place is called to this day. The hearer or reader is taught by the story to know the place. But I was not taught to read the stories in the Bible with places in mind. And because of that, I was denied any formation in a pedagogy of place, of paying attention to stones and rocks and rivers and trees, and to know that my moral vision, my moral vision was meant to be coordinated by the earth itself. That is why this place is called this to this day. Nor was I taught to read the stories of scripture with animals in mind. They were always just the backdrop, the white noise that I was trained to ignore. What I was taught to pay attention to was who got the land. And the land was already presented to me as private property owned by an individual or by a nation. The land was never alive and communicative and speaking. It was property. The struggle over land was the central matter that shaped the way I read the world being displayed in Scripture. I was denied, I was denied the ability to see a God dancing in and living with the land and other creatures, a God who joined that God's own people in the land. But the way, but this way of reading the world pressed me to see myself and my world through possession and self-possession and taught me the crucial lesson. What is that lesson? Either own yourself, own your place, Claim yourself or claim your place or allow someone else to possess you and your land and your labor and your voice. Of course, I am, I am in fact now touching the broad contours of a global struggle that has been with us in earnest since the founding of the modern colonial moment as people all over the globe right now, right now, sisters and brothers, are fighting within and against nation states and corporations for self-determination of life and land. As the great writer and philosopher Vandanda Shiva so eloquently argues in her work that women in the majority world are in a life and death struggle over the seed of their bodies and the seed in the ground, she says. Self-possession is about struggle, but it is also about a loss, a loss of a vision of a commons that could guide us in recognizing deep and abiding connection. Thinking our lives through this this distorted sense of possession means that racial separation and segregation has been naturalized as a way of life. You see, the story of America, which is still not taught in most places, colleges, universities, undergraduate, high school, the story of America indeed most of the world formed by the Western world is the story of land seizure and segregation. We live in a geographic and racial wound that we have never been able to comprehend fully or begin to address in any substantive way, and that is the devastating effects 
of private property and the spatial distribution of goods and services calibrated along racial lines. Race and private property gave birth to the modern wounding realities of segregation. What haunts me and what I want to haunt you tonight is the way Christianity has been and continues to be complicit with that wounding. Christian faith and life continue to be driven by the geographic wounds created by land developers and city planners and civil engineers and real estate agents, city government officials and architects. We are, however, not simply passive spectators to the constant geographic cuttings and turnings of contemporary life. We have performed our faith right on top of those developments, often presenting them as natural and normal ways of forming life and living in the world. When in fact, they have never been natural or normal. One powerful example of this in the United States was the history and the phenomenon of sundown towns. Everyone in this auditorium ought to know what a sundown town is because in this state, there were many sundown towns. You know, there were not there were not really any sundown towns in the South. Sundown towns were in this part of the world. Sundown towns, for those of you who may not know, sundown towns were towns all across the U.S. that from the beginning of the 1890s through the 1940s into the 1950s purposely removed and kept out African Americans and sometimes Jews and sometimes Asians from their towns. These were towns that aggressively sought to construct themselves as all white communities. These towns, many of them, dare I say most of them, filled with people deeply Christian, constructed a geographic whiteness that permeated the earth, the land, and all their surroundings. Now, in order to understand what I am saying, you must forget about whiteness. You must forget about whiteness as phenotype, or bodily characteristic, or even a European heritage, and see it for what it is, a sick vision of maturity, a vision of maturity based on achieving mastery of its world, control of its land and resources, and a freedom to live unencumbered by anyone, especially people deemed different. To become white was to aim one's life at controlling one's world, at possessing one's land, and mastering one's environment. Yet the deepest problem with thinking life through distorted possession is that it turns our minds and hearts always toward ownership and accumulation, marking life inside the commodity chain, if not inescapable, then certainly compelling, bordering on addictive. To claim myself requires, to claim myself requires I own my own home or farm or car or gun or education or business. And we have all been formed to think such ownership. We've all been formed to think inside the line. And of course, we in academic institutions constantly configure education as initiation into ownership of knowledge, of self, and the means through which to deepen and widen ownership in this world. Whatever emancipatory sensibilities or possibilities we hold in our pedagogies and curriculums tends to wash out 
in performances of self-possession that give students little sense of enfolded and overlapping life except by the choices they make. There are, however, two situations that may help us, that may help expose the deeper problems of our prevailing vision of possession. The first situation is waste. Trash. Trash. You see, our trash is not simply a byproduct of our processes of production and consumption. It is the irrepressible inner logic of possession as break, as separation, as enclosure. Our prevailing vision of possession binds us inextricably to disposability as both a way of life and a consequence of failed productivity. If it is useless, you can finish the sentence, throw it away. To possess, as we now understand it, invites us into relentless, relentless calibrations of use value, distorting the way we evaluate life and constantly undermining any deep sense of connectivity to one another or the earth. Possession teaches us to narrate our lives through rituals of ownership. Possession teaches us to narrate our lives through rituals of ownership that thwart the development of a strong sense of the commons, which of course brings me to the second situation, something I mentioned this morning, and that is scarcity. There are fabricated scarcities in this world, driven by the shifting distributions of food dictated by global markets, national instabilities, crop failure, war, drought, and so many other things. Yet scarcity always confronts waste as a shared absurdity in a world where feeding everyone and producing enough food for everyone is not only a real possibility, but is constantly thwarted by the reciprocal actions of nation states and global corporations. Waste and scarcity, my friends, point to unsustainable practices, social, political, and economic. But the question is whether we can begin to see that they also point to an unsustainable vision of possession. There is another vision of possession that is yet with us in many indigenous communities. One where possession is not imagined as a gesture of enclosure or separation, but an overlapping and enfolding bound to a continuum of use and sharing. This is a vision of being possessed by claimed by a people and a place. The world of scripture builds on this vision of possession but draws it forward to a new reality enabled by the Holy Spirit where the disciples of Jesus are pressed to allow themselves to be claimed by new people and new places. The disciples of Jesus go into the world not to claim people and places, but to be claimed by people and places. It is precisely God the Spirit who enables not only a sharing of life, but who also draws us into the lives of people and places, inviting us to give witness with them from specific places to the multiplicity of God's creation and the divine desire for life together. We must learn, my friends, to think possession through the spirit of the living God. To think possession through the spirit is to think against the lie. It is to think against the normalizing of property and prison and border as though 
they exist as though how they exist and where they exist and why they exist is not a matter of moral struggle. Property and prison and border are not holy things. To think possession through the spirit is to think against fabricated geographic distinctions between nation states who all share a common earth. As the celebrated botanist Peter Raven has said that this planet and all biological life can no longer afford a world shaped by the selfishness, greed, and narcissism of nation states. Each trying to secure the well-being of only their own people in utter disregard for the ecosystems that sustain us all. To think possession through the spirit is to think against nationalism. You see, nationalism was a new way to reassemble life with the land. But nationalism was never life inside the land, never life lived in serious reciprocity with plant and animal, sky and season, dirt and water, listening, learning, finding a way to know oneself as deep partner in the world through a particular place. Nationalism was and is ownership. Property ownership made plural and made the universal right of a people to their space. Yes, there was attachment to land. Yes, there was blood bound to soil. And yes, there was deep sentiment and sensibilities born of living in the land. But this is different, sisters and brothers. This is owning the land, not being owned by the land. This is speaking for the land as one who controls it not having land and animals speak through you, as though you extend their lives through your life. You see, nationalism places people inside borders and borders inside of us. But to think possession through the spirit is to envision life joined to others and other places as listeners and learners of new ways of life to be lived together. This is what disciples do. To think possession through the spirit is to rethink self-possession. To claim oneself, to possess oneself, has been an important part of the history of so many people trying to survive and thrive in this world. Self-possession remains a hard-won victory in a battle against racial and gender oppression, violence, and theft. Like Aquiano, self-possession was the key to his freedom. But this, but this was a freedom surrounded by constraint and shaped in the demand for ownership to sustain one's freedom. If self-possession is to become authentic freedom, then it must grow out of connection, a connection enabled by the Spirit of God that allows a community to speak and breathe through me and finds my sense of self not in what I own, but in being claimed by a people and a place being formed through love. My hope is that someday, soon, we Christians will remember what we know but we are yet to understand. All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thy own have we given thee. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now, 
I'll be glad to take some questions. <clears throat> so if you would, please um, come down to the aisle, tell me your name, uh, and then ask your question. So please, please don't be shy. I'm only here one more night, just tonight, so please come on down. If you're, if you're in the balcony and you have a question, is there a microphone up there? If not, come on down. There, oh, there's, there's two up there, okay, great. Well, come to the microphone and ask your question, please. If there was something you didn't understand or something went over your head or something that slipped under you, just, that's okay, you can ask me, you can ask me what I said. Just actually right here. Is yes, lean into the mic. Right. One, two, one, two, okay, we're good. <laughs> uh, my name is Jeremy, I'm a freshman. And one question that just came to mind as you were speaking, what's a sermon that maybe you didn't preach that really sticks out to you since you heard thousands and thousands before? What was a sermon that like really stuck out to you? What, what was a sermon that really stuck out to me? Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a hard question. Many of them stuck out to me. Uh, um, probably the most important sermon that ever stuck out to me was the one in which uh, the, the point of the minister was to say to me, um, God is calling you. You need to come down and listen to what God is saying. That one sticks with me. Another question. Please, yes. Um, in 1964. Your name, sir, if you don't mind. Oh, I'm sorry. That's My okay. name is Matt Zonizer. Thank you, sir. Um, in 1964, shortly after his death, my father saw um, passed the Wilderness Act signed by President Johnson that preserved wild lands in perpetuity for everyone. I wonder if you think that is a type of possession or a Holy Spirit initiated uh, collective understanding of land. Thank you for your question. The question was, um, my dear brother mentioned that the, um, the Land Preservation Act that Johnson, uh, President Johnson passed in 64, which built on earlier land preservation acts of other, other presidents. Well, it's good and bad, isn't it? It is good that land was preserved for, for future generations. It's bad that so many indigenous peoples were never consulted in the process of preservation. It's bad that many indigenous peoples around the world are being pushed off land that they live on because nation states want to preserve the land for everyone except for them. That's the bad. The bad is the loss of a history and the stories of people who live on land. There was this great documentary a few years ago done about, about the, Maasai, the Maasai people in Africa. And um, there was one segment of the story that talks about one of the bad habits of the National Geographic when they used to do filming. So if you've ever seen a National Geographic film and you know, they, they go to the Serengeti or somewhere and they show this, all this beautiful land and all these, be these animals and the land looks empty. And so in this documentary, what the person said, let me show you what happens, what actually happens when the National Geographic does this kind of thing or any of these nature shows when they do this kind of thing. So they show the cameras taking pictures of all the wild animals and, you know, the lions chasing chasing their prey and the snakes and the elephants. And then they scanned the camera behind them and there were a bunch of people standing there waiting for them to finish filming. Why? Because that's where the people live. They made them move so they could give this image that there's nobody there, but they were just standing there waiting for them to leave so they could go back into the land where they were with those wild animals. This is part of the logic behind conservation sometimes. It imagines an empty world that's for us all to enjoy, except the very people who inhabited that empty world. But of course, 
there's a connection between that and kind of gentrification, isn't it? We always imagine the empty before we imagine the community. Another question, thank you, sir. Another question. Good evening, Dr. Jennings. I'm David. Thank you, David. A um, couple of questions that I have, really one, but you mentioned about Christianity, Christianity's complicit nature in this idea of seizure and uh, demarcation and how we basically are so intertwined with what we consider to be a, a vision of the Bible, but it's actually a twisted vision of scripture. Mm -hmm. How do we begin, and I, I'll go back for a second, then I'll come forward. I was in Rwanda this summer, and I began to learn more about the genocide and you know, the, the, the demarcation of people. You have mm -hmm. the Tutsis, the Hutus, and the Twa that never existed right. until the Belgians came in and co uh, colonized the right. Right. country. Mm -hmm. and they created these divisions mm -hmm. and then left the people to defend for themselves. Yes. And we see in um, the genocide that in four months over a million people were killed. And the problem I had when I went through the museum was this one line that you have to read and listen to the interpreter. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. said, and the Catholic Church said such classification was okay. Right. And I'm not demonizing the Catholic Church. Ultimately, no, no. it goes back to Christianity. Mm -hmm. how, do we begin to, how do we begin to unwind this marriage? Where do we start? Because I think we get Great it question. to a degree. Great question. So, yeah. Great question. You know, uh, there, there are... There's a work that has to be done with the Bible. The first work that has to be done with the Bible is to introduce Christians to themselves in the Bible. Um, we are Gentiles who became followers of a Jewish Jesus, which means that um, the point is in the New Testament, or the Jewish people, not us, that I always like to say, that if we were in the time of Jesus and we um, came, you know, we came, if we came up to Jesus to listen to him preaching and said, Jesus, we're just so glad, this is what we would see of Jesus. That is, he wouldn't be talking to us. And if we said, excuse me, Jesus, he would do this. And keep, keep talking to the people he came for. Now, there's something really important about that because it begins to place us in a position of humility. The great Catholic theologian Sean Copeland says that um, we, we have to think of ourselves as a thinking margin, that we are those who came into the story of another people, came from the margins, so that we understand ourselves as people who always can sense those at the margin. Now, of course, in the long history of Christianity, very early, we got tired of seeing ourselves at the margins. And we decided that we were the people of God. The formation of whiteness is built on Gentile hubris. So the, the first work is to introduce people to the actual story of Gentile inclusion, the grace of it. To, to, to give people a sense of Acts 10 and Ephesians 2 as the beginning of their story. That's, that's where we would want to begin. But it's, it's this, is a, this is a complicated question. And if I had more time, I would, I would spend talking about all the vicissitudes of whiteness. But that's a good place to start. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Another question? Take your time. Don't rush. Take your time. I was just wondering like, what kind of experiences or led you to like, feeling called to do ministry. Just kind of curious what your experience. Oh, thanks. So that's a great question. The question was, what kind of experiences led to my sense of call to do ministry? I, I was born and raised in Grand Rapids, Michigan. 
Um, and Grand Rapids, Michigan is a, a immigrant town populated primarily by the Dutch, but there's also Polish, we're Polish immigrants, Italians, but primarily Dutch. And I went to Calvin College. And Grand Rapids is a very Christian town. It's the home of a denomination. It is, um, it has uh, some of the most important Christian book um, publishers and distributors in the world, Zondervan's, Baker, Erdman's, uh, company called Kriegel, they were all in Grand Rapids. There were churches on every corner, literally almost on every corner. Um, I could throw a rock in any direction and hit a church, and often I did. <laughs> um, the mother church of, of the Christian Reformed denomination was right down the street from my house. I played in, the, I played in their parking lot. They had a great basketball court. So I was surrounded by churches, and you know, um, there, were, there were every kind of church you could name, uh, Seven Day of Venice, Pentecostal, Baptist, of every variety, Pentecostal, every variety, Charismatic, you know, Catholic, Presbyterian, every denomination was in, was in my town. And, and Christians everywhere. Calvin College, and there was another Christian college up the street from where I live. All Christians everywhere. And it was the, the most racist town you could ever be raised in at the same time. And so very early, I was trying to understand how, how could a place be so deeply Christian and so deeply racist at the same time? And what drove me, what really drove my questioning and my thinking and my searching and my questioning to God was asking God to help me understand this. And it dawned on me that the questions that I was asking were the questions God was placing in me. God was asking the question to me, through me. Why is this place this way, Willie? And sometimes, you know, a sense of call to ministry is not God saying, go. It's God putting a question in you that you can't rest until you answer. Sometimes that's the way you know you're called, not because God says go, but God gives you a question that won't let you go. Yeah? All right, another, another question for me. Come on, friends, we're running, running out of time, so you might want to hurry up and ask me a question. Come on down. Yes, come on. And anyone in the balcony, please. Uh, I see you back there hiding, but you know, if you have a question, come on, come on down. Great. There's a question here, and then I want you to ask your question. Go ahead, go ahead, my dear sister. Okay. Um, I'm Tyler Anderson. Nice to meet you. Um, first, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, it sounded like you said to claim oneself is to possess oneself, and I was wondering what is the difference between claiming and possessing. Uh, and the great question. The question was, what's the difference between claiming and possession? In the way I'm using it, there's really, there's really not a difference. The, the point is, is that we're inside a long history where people, in order to be able to, to claim themselves, to claim their own voice, to claim their own sense of self-determination, they've had to operate in this idea of, of possession. And to sustain the, the freedom one wants in life, requires that one move toward serious ownership of something. You are not free in the West unless you own something. And that's a tragedy. That's not something that should be celebrated. It's something that needs to be reflected upon. Because if freedom requires ownership, then many people will never be free. Yes, now, now, brother, up in, the, up in the balcony, you had a question. Okay, is that a microphone right there? Is that a microphone? Oh, that's not? Well, come on down. Come on down and ask your question. I was just saying hello. Oh. That's, okay, you just want to say hello? Okay, well, <laughs> hello. <laughs> uh, another question? Another question, friends?
Hey, I'm Moses. Um, What's your name? Moses. Moses. Nice to meet you, Moses. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any like practical ideas for us to go about thinking in a way that reconciles in a world that's consumed with possession. That's a great question. He says, are any practical ideas about how to um, live in the world that um, wants to move you toward this idea of possession? Well, as I, I, I was trying to say toward the end of the lecture, the first word is a word you all hear a lot now, resist. Resist. And that resistance begins <clears throat> by not simply accepting the ongoing creation of prison, of property, and of border as natural, of segregated spaces, of neighborhoods shaped simply by price points, of life lived in separate endeavors of wish fulfillment. To resist that, to question it, and to see how it works, that's the first thing. To see where people are being separated and who is structurally, geographically doing the separating. To see the ways in which prisons and borders and property are working to undermine the possibility of real connection, of real community. This is the phenomenon we all face, that people can live next to each other and not in any way, shape, or form see themselves connected. That's an absurdity. But we have all been trained to think by the line. So if it's not my property, if it's beyond my property line, it's none of my business. Now, we know that that property line, it's, it, legally it's real, but materially and geographically, it's a fiction. So, to be able to drive in a car and go from a neighborhood that's well manicured, affluent, you know, quiet, beautiful, things are going well, through a neighborhood where it's not well manicured and there are, you, you can see misery and people in pain, and to not be disturbed by that is a formation. Something has happened in us so that that has been naturalized. Because those two neighborhoods are not separate. They are on the same ground. They, they, the same water flows through them both. The same animals, the same air. They are connected. But in our minds, they are not connected because the property line separates them. What we need to do as Christians is to understand if we function in our minds by the line, we give a lie to the idea that we believe in a creation. So, yes, we want to start. You want to start to challenge that. Your life is not to be lived by the dictates of real estate. Another question, another question, another question. And of course, those of you who are heading toward the church, this is a major problem because most churches are geographically oblivious. They exist in spaces that they don't even know how those spaces and places work. But they think what's going on inside the church has a quality and character that can be acknowledged apart from knowledge of what's going on outside the church, which is crazy. Yes, my brother, next question. <clears throat> Hello, uh, my name is Josiah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a ministry and business major here. Oh, wonderful. Um, and so part of my, I guess, personal vision for ministry um, kind of entails missions and community development work. Wonderful. Um, but your speech today has really challenged some of the language that I hear used um, in the sphere of community development and missions in particular. Um, so I think it's safe to say that, that missions work, especially evangelical missions work, has had a smear on it of white um, superiority um, and yeah. a thought of that we are going to save people yeah. when that's not truly the case. Um, and I think community development in particular, especially with several organizations I've already worked with in the past, have used terms of ownership yes. um, to describe their work. So 
they say, well, these people just need to take ownership of their right. community, or they, right. they need to take ownership of right. um, the activities that they're doing. So what, first, what alternative language can we use to better describe the, the work that we want to do in those communities, um, as well as like, mm -hmm. how can we embody that in a better way to, to as you said, great question. be possessed by the people in the place? Great question, very great question. So, and let's take a step back from the language we use to maybe a different way to approach how we exist in places. Everywhere I go, I say every community, every... All right, all right, all right, all right, yeah, 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 very good, very good. Um, every, everywhere I go, I, I always say that every community, every town, needs something like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, let me say that again, because some of you are talking. Um, every place needs a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Now, for those of you who don't know what that is, uh, after the end of apartheid, um, the government formed what was called a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And the purpose of that was to have people come forward who, know, who knew the stories and the hidden history of what happened in apartheid, and without fear of being um, imprisoned or um, you know, being killed, they, they would confess what was done so that the hidden history would be revealed. Now, in every community in this country, there is a long history of the geography and how a place came, came, came to be, how segregation came to be, who was kept out, who was allowed in, um, how things came to function in terms of their inequalities and, and the violence and, and the history of a place. Most people don't know that history. And one of the first things that has to happen is that we as Christians, we need to know that history. So before we decide that we're going to help an impoverished community, we have to find out how it became an impoverished community. That's a really important thing. And then we, we go from that to the building with the people who know that history, a vision for what ought to happen. Because sometimes what ought to happen is not that an impoverished community needs to be placed on a trajectory of development, but the very configuration of how this community came to be and other communities came to exist in advantage, that has to be addressed. So that an advantaged community next to a disadvantaged community, it's not just a question of trying to help the disadvantaged community. It's a question of making the advantaged community accountable to the resources that flow easily and quickly through it and the resources that do not flow through this community next to it. That's, the, that's where you want to start so that you don't turn to places that need help and imagine that they became places that need help without those who made them that way. Great question. All right, I think we have time for one more question or two more questions. One more question. All right, so one more question. Somebody who, um, who hasn't asked a question, please. Hi there. My name is Mikey. Uh, hold on. Sorry, Scott. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear him. Somebody's here. My name is Mikey, and Hi, I Mikey. hate to ask the last question. But That's all right, Mikey. That's fine. Uh, when I was listening to you, I couldn't help but think about what, what scripture passages in the history of Christianity have we used uh, or misread or uh, pulled out of its true meaning uh, to develop this possession of. And I couldn't help but think about how uh, Christians have a misreading of Paul uh, but with, and the distinction between Sarks and Numa when he's mm -hmm. talking about the distinction between body and spirit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think your possession of correlates well with Sarks and your possession by the spirit correlates well with the Numa. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to land the plane, but um, 
in what ways has maybe the history of Christianity uh, misread Paul and had this dualistic thinking um, and out of that comes this possession of Mm -hmm. and in what ways uh, does your distinction provide a new lens to read Paul's epistles in a a new liberating and embodied way? Yeah, that's a great question. And and working with um, the the Sark um, distinction might, might be helpful. But, you know, you originally asked kind of what scriptures, there's, there's obviously one that um, within, the, in, within juridical language in the history of this country played a crucial role. And that's the, that's the Genesis passage about subduing the earth. One of the arguments against Native American possession, continued possession of particular lands, is that because they were not cultivating and being productive with various lands, they were living in um, denial of the Genesis dictum to subdue the earth. So that passage showed up a lot. Now, um, with Paul, that's a more complicated matter. What, it, what is important, as I mentioned this before, is if we, place, if we place the work of Paul inside the history of Gentile inclusion, then that gives us a better lens to think about it. And which brings me back to the Acts 10 passage. This is such an important passage that most people don't understand. And what I mean by the Acts 10 passage, I mean the, the sheet that is lowered from heaven, where Peter's on the roof praying, and then there, he's hungry, and then the sheet gets lowered from heaven. Many of you know the story. And um, God says to him, rise, Peter, slay and eat. Now, what most of us don't realize is when, when we're reading that text, there's a whole lot more going on than just God trying to expand Peter's culinary palate. People were identified with their animals. So to lower a sheet with animals that no pious, faithful Jew would eat is also reminding, reminding Peter that there is a prohibition against being with Gentiles in their ways of life. And so the sheet is lowered and the animals that are being offered, utterly radical. Because God is saying, take these animals that you have been taught and trained not to eat because they are tied to these people and eat them which in effect is saying, join the ways of life of the very people that you were taught never to join. Because to eat their animals in the way they eat their animals is to join their way of life. That is radical and powerful. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, it's word of God against word of God. A new word against old word. God saying, you have heard it said before, but I say to you now this. And the now is that if you eat this animal, you are saying to this people, I want to be a part of you because you are this animal. This is your animal kin that I am taking into myself. And of course, in Acts 10, Peter fights with God about this. It is a struggle because Peter is saying, there is no way I'm going to do this. And then those famous words that now, given what I've just said, we can understand the power of them. God says to Peter, what I have made clean, you must never call unclean. And then the knock at the door. And of course, why is that so important? Because without that story, you would not be in this room right now. The only reason you're in this room right now is because God convinced Peter to desire something he was repulsed by, you. And of course, that's the gospel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.